morning. So, um, I get to talk with you a little bit. Um, so a lot of this is going to be going over some of the stuff that um, Pastor Jack has been talking about for the last couple of weeks. Um, I titled this Our Life in God because that's what we've been studying for the last month or so. And we've looked at a lot of scriptures. Um, we looked at 2 Corinthians 2.12, 1 John 3.21, Romans 10.17, and many others. And what we found in that is that what we experience, in part, is a result of our choices, our response to what God has done for us and is speaking to us. We have found that our actions and our beliefs affect, and the things that come out of our heart can have a profound impact on our walk with God. That's what Holly was talking about this morning. Her confession, how she talks, what she says. Um, so what I want to do real quick, or... I only have two pages of notes, so we could probably go for a long time, but we'll see, we'll see how well we do this. Um, I want to go over some of the points that Pastor Jack made, and then I'm going to uh, open up, ooh, I guess we're getting late. I'll go into uh, some other things in addition to that if we have time. The first thing he pointed out is that there's three major components in our walk with God. The first one is the love walk. We've talked about that a lot here. The scripture, one scripture for that is John 13, 34, and 35. The second one is faith. Um, and a scripture for that is 11, Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The next one is... Um, how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And he went into this in some detail to try to make sure that we got the point. You know, he, we, we looked at, he looked at John 14, 16, and 17, and John 16, 7. Those were the two main scriptures that he put under there. Um, in 16, 7, Jesus tells us, hey, it's, this is Gurney's quick summary. It's a really good idea that I'm leaving because if I go, I'll send the comforter, send somebody to be with you. Um, and if I don't go, he won't come. And then in John uh, uh, 14, 16 to 17, he says the same thing. Ooh, I've had the same scripture down here twice. I'll have to find it here. Um, 16. Typo in my notes. That's John 16, 7. It says, um, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. And the other one was uh, John 14. John 14. 16 and 17. 16. Okay. And it says, and I will pray... Pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be, abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, and he dwells with you, and will be in you. So that, that's, that's that notion that we are and can be led by the Holy Spirit. The second point we saw is um, that God made, I mean, I'm, I'm, God made three provisions to help us with our walk with him. The first one is his written word. And you can just look at Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from you, etc. The second word, the second one is the living word, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. But it, we can look at Galatians 2.20. Maybe I should use paper. I'm faster. But we'll try. Uh, which says, um, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And the third provision is the leadership of the body of Christ, which we can pick up from Ephesians 4, 11 to 20, where Gurney's quick summary, he says, I've set you apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and their job is to perfect us for the ministry to the world. That's, that's what's going on in that, in that period. Um, so he's got it up there. So 
Now, after we, look, after we looked at that, we next, he, Pastor Jack brought up this point, that, we re, that the truth that God disciplines us and corrects our mistakes, and that if we respond or submit to his discipline, it will lead to life. There's three, there's a lot of scriptures around this. The first one is John 16, 8. Um, assuming. 8, which says, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then it says, Of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the rule of this world is judged. Of course, we're in the world, we get convicted too. And then there's also 2 Corinthians 7, 8 to 10, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, and Hebrews 13, 5 to 11. All these scriptures talk about the fact that God loves us as children and that he loves us. And because he loves us, he's going to discipline us. And if we receive his discipline, there's a tremendous big benefit. We'll go look at Hebrews because I think that incorporates the other one. Hebrews 13, 5. It says here, starting in chapter 13, verse 5. Five, I said we would start. Um, nope, we'll skip down to, maybe I wrote down the wrong scripture. 13, 5, 2, yep, I did. Oh, nope, I wrote down the wrong scripture. In Hebrews, and we won't search for it right now, um, he talks about the Father disciplines everybody who, whom he loves. Um, that's what I was looking for. Somehow I got the wrong one. Yep, I did. Okay. So we'll move on. What? 12. Oh, all right, 12, 6. For whom the Lord love, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. If you endure ch chastening, God deals with you. This is chapter 12, verse 6. As with, with sons, for what son is there whom the father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as it seems best to them, but he, referring to God, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So I was off by chapter. Okay, so the point is that God's instruction to us is for our benefit. And last week, um, we, we, we reviewed that we stand in his righteousness. We need to be a hearer and doer of the word. And... We have peace in our lives. We can have peace in our lives. Let's, uh, we're right here. Uh, let's see. Twelve. So if you look at Colossians 3, 12 to 17, there's this great instruction that says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, as Christ has forgiven you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called, in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, or dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So that's just like this really great thing that, is, that we can have this peace in our life. And as I was looking at this, the Lord reminded me of something that, um, that something that he's, that, that, um, that's important as we, as we move through our walk with him. And that is that we need to humble ourselves. 
James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Um, and 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Likewise, you, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And 1 Peter 5.6 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, upon him, for he cares for you. Um, the point here is that the Bible, in these scriptures in particular, is telling us to humble ourselves. It's not telling us that God will humble us. And we have a choice to make. Back to what Holly was saying. How do we respond? What do we come out of? Where are we going? And... Um, And that's an important attribute. Um, and when we think about James 4, 6 to 7, which says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so, what we're told, what James is telling us is God is going to resist the proud, and pride is the opposite of humility. And I'm not talking about humility the way the world defines it. I'm talking about humility the way it's defined in the Bible as I, as I understand it, which I picked up from the teaching that we got on, from Doug Jones on submission uh, last year. And just to review that, he said, um, he said, when you submit to God, then you're humbling yourself. And he said, he gave us these three words to summarize submission. He said, retire, withdraw, and yield. So, in God's definition, submitting to God means retiring from your way. Retiring means leaving it behind, turning away from it. Okay? Like you retire from a job, you don't go back to work the next day. Uh, if an army retreats, which is a form of retire, they lose. So you lose your way. The second word, withdraw, means withdraw from your way. So he's given us these two words to help us to, rem to remind us that we have to step away from how we would do things if we're submitting to God. And the third word is yield. And he says, yield to God's way. Yield to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you in your heart. Yield to what he's doing. That's that's what submitting to God means. And when you submit to God, you've humbled yourself. So if you've retired from your way, and you've withdrawn from your way, and you're yielding to God's way, then you're submitted to God. And the truth of the matter is, we, we have many faceted lives, and we can do this in one area of our life without doing it in another area of our life. So what we do as we go through this, go through this, this life is we learn how to do that in all areas of life. And that's what it means to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And as you increase the degree to which you're retiring from your ways, and withdrawing from your ways, and yielding to God's ways, then God will be drawing near to you. And he'll be working more and more in you. And he'll be helping you to go to the places you want to go. So that's what we've been looking at for the past few weeks. And now... Um, the rest of what I have to talk about comes out of 1 Peter. Because I was reading 1 Peter, and I realized that in, in one sense, 1 Peter is a summary of all this teaching. And I mean, I could probably talk about 1 Peter for a couple of weeks, but we don't have a couple of weeks. So we're going to just take the next few minutes and look into uh, 1 Peter. So if you'll turn to 1 Peter... And we're not going to use the computer for this because um, it's not as efficient as the paper. Um, put that away. All right. So, as I've been, I've been through First Peter several times over the last few weeks just because it kept speaking to me and speaking to me. And what I ended up doing was, just so I could get my head around it and understand what God was saying to me, was I divided it into four different sections. I divided it into an introduction, introduction I divided it into sections that talk about what God has done for us, and I divided it into sections that talk about 
how we should respond to God based on his work for us. And finally, there's a summary. Now, there's a whole bunch of deep truths in the whole of the book. But for today, I feel like I just want to talk about the middle two sections. For example, just to, as an illustrate, Doug Jones, Jones's teaching on humility comes out of the fourth section of First Peter. All right? So the first section we're going to skip. It's First Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. It's only two verses. It's just an introduction. And Peter says, I'm the Apostle Peter, and I'm writing to you guys. Now, he's writing, uh, he's writing to a church that's in the midst of persecution because of their faith in Jesus. And so, the second section, he, in, which starts in 1 Peter 3, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 1, verse 3, and goes through uh, uh, verse 25, and then includes a little bit out of chapter 2, he summarizes or talks about what God has done for us. The first scripture I want to look at is 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he tells us what we get as a result of that, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, he's telling us or reminding us that we praise God. That's what this blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his mercy, he's giving us living hope through what he did through Christ. Through, his, uh, uh, through the death, through his life, his, his resurrection. He raised Christ from the dead to tell us, to prove to us, to show that we have this inheritance. And then he tells us, oh, you're really happy. This is verse 6. Um, and... And he goes on to give you some other things. And he says, and, and, and in verse 7 he says, Look, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's two, there's two, this is really, gets a little complicated, but there's two revelations of Jesus Christ that he's talking about in here. The first is the revelation of Christ as the Son of God, you know, in Romans, if we believe in our heart that, that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And the second is the revelation of Christ that hasn't come yet, which is the second coming of Christ. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on doing this, but in either case, we praise God because of both. Because, of his pres because we're here in this time before he has returned, and we praise him because our salvation is because of the work that Jesus Christ did, and we understand that. And we praise him because we know that he is coming again. And when he comes again, all of the wrong stuff going on is going to be done away with. That's my quick summary of Revelations. Okay? Or at least part of it. Now, he goes on in verse 8 to say, Look, though... And I'm skipping a couple, one phrase here. Well, I'll start at the beginning. Whom having not seen, he means you have not seen Jesus. Peter saw Jesus. He says in one of his epistles, I was with him on the holy mountain when the word spoke to him. So Peter was there when God spoke with a human voice and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm in well pleased. But now he's writing to those who have believed because of the gospel that's gone out to all the world. And he's saying, and that includes us. None of us were on the holy mountain with Jesus, at least not as far as I know. Anyway, whom having not seen, you love. We haven't seen him, but we love him. We, we haven't seen him with our eyes like Peter saw him. We haven't walked with him and smelled his sweat and saw him feed four or five thousand people, but we love him. Though you do not see him, and we don't see him each day as we walk around him here, though we see his work in our lives, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. There he's back to that point. You don't see him with your eyes. You haven't walked with him, but you believe. And so you get the salvation of your souls. You get the new life that's springing up and spreading, spreading in you. And then in the next uh, three verses, two verses, he tells us that the prophets in the Old Testament 
were preaching of this salvation to us. It was revealed to them that they were talking about the time when Christ would come. This is in 10 and 11. Um, they didn't exactly know it. But in 12 he says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So it's always the case that the gospel is preached to people in this day and for all future days until Christ returns because of the Holy Spirit that resides in somebody who is sent from heaven. And then he tells us um, two things in 13 and 14, and we'll look at 15. He tells us, you know, watch your mind, watch over your mind, keep your mind, and focus on what God has done for us. And he says, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the world. This is again what God has done for us. I've given you Christ. I've sent my son. By stripes you're healed. His sacrifice is your salvation. So don't be conformed to the world. He doesn't say, I won't conform you to the world. He says, don't be conformed to the world, which means you have a choice. It's your responsibility to not be conformed to the world. And then in 15 he says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. 16, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Now, there's this principle that God's not going to give you something you can't do. Well, he's given you Christ. And when Christ left, we heard in that other scripture, the Holy Spirit came to dwell with us and lives inside of you. So he's enabled you to be holy as he is holy. He's enabled you to allow the submission to God to, to influence every single area of your life. He's enabled you. Are you going to let him? Okay. And then in 18 he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. What he's referring to here is the sacrifice of Christ because in Psalms it tells us he will not see corruption. So he's reminding us that Christ died and was not corrupted. Corrupted means Normally when a person dies, if you don't do anything, their body decays and rots away. That's the corruption he's referring to. But that didn't happen to Christ. He was raised. His body was made alive again and changed into a new body. So we weren't redeemed with corruptible things. And listen to some of the corruptible things he talks about. Silver, gold, right? Or the traditions we see received aimlessly from our fathers, those that don't align with the Lord. If you grew up in a Christian family, then you probably received some uncorruptible things from your parents. But you were redeemed with the precious 19, the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish, without spot. Um, we just discussed that. And, and he was manifested in these last times to you, 20, 21, through, who through whom who through him, Christ, believed in God, who raised him, Christ, from the dead, and gave him, Christ, glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Okay. I mean, so this is what, this is pretty much what God has done for us. There's one other thing here we'll get to in chapter 2. Well, let's do it now, and then we'll summarize it. Um, I could be talking all day if I don't have a clock here. Okay, um, he says in 9 and 10, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his, the capital H, meaning God, own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him, God, and Christ, who called you out of darkness into his, God's, marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. Listen to that. We, we had no mercy before Christ. And now we've got mercy. And even more than mercy, we are His people. He is our God. And it's through the work of his son that we have life and we have 
health and we have what we have. And we have the, so he has equipped us. He, in another place in scripture it says he translated us or transformed or moved us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Prior to, prior to Christ, we were in darkness. There was no light in us. But when we responded, when we got Christ, we received Christ, we were moved out of that kingdom into the kingdom of light. And in that light, in that kingdom, no darkness dwells. So, what are we supposed to do about all this? You know, it's like being born new, right? When you're born, you sort of just have to grow up and you don't know what's doing. We've had the, my son and daughter-in-law took off for a couple of days uh, break before the third child shows up. So we had the benefit of having our two grandchildren running around for a couple of days in the house. My, my daughter and son-in-law, yeah, I did that backwards. Sorry about that. Um, and I was thinking about what I was about to share and watching them and realizing, I mean, it's five and a half and two and a half, right? Nothing exists except what's in, the immediate, in their immediate presence. They run and play and talk and jabber. Afghanistan doesn't exist. The Middle East doesn't exist. South America doesn't exist. The, the income taxes don't exist. Monday's job does not exist. What is it? What is it? They are completely secure in where they are in the future because they have their children. And when he says, unless you, earlier on it says, well, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Somebody was preaching on this. And, um, and Jesus said, whosoever. So the question, who is the greatest, is a human perspective that says, we always think about this and there can only be one greatest, right? One greatest. I think I got this from Doug Jones too. But Jesus' response says, whosoever. And what he's saying is, there's not just one. It's whosoever has faith as a little child. That person is great in the kingdom of God. So each and every one of us can be great in the kingdom of God if we'll retire, withdraw, and submit. So in 1 Peter, he gives us some things that that will help us understand what that means. So let's go over them. So we'll start with, um, where are we? Chapter 2, verse 11. You remember, he's just, actually, we'll go, there's one before that, because there, these were in our leave. So we'll go to chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. If, for all these things that God has done for us, he then says, he, the ones that were listed in chapter 1, he says, therefore, Laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And then skipping to four. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. So when, when God takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and puts us into the kingdom of light, we become living stones that are chosen by him and precious. And he goes on to tell us that he's going to be building us into a temple fit for his habitation. Now he's only building one temple. He doesn't have a Catholic temple and a Baptist temple and a Pentecostal temple. There is one temple, the church of God, that he's building. And all those who believe in him are living stones that are, that are being used to build that temple. Okay? And then, right after, he, in verse 11, right after he tells us about being a chosen generation and a royal priesthood, he says, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. There's another response. He's saying, I'm begging you, because of these things that God has done for you, as sojourners, meaning we don't, this isn't our home. Our home is when Christ returns and we're united with him. As pilgrims, one man wrote, we are only pilgrims on this earth, following our Lord. You know, abstain, that's the action. Abstain from fleshly love, which war against the soul. What he's telling you here 
is that if that these lusts that we used to have before he set us free are the things that war against us and try to drag us back into darkness and that we are to abstain from them. And then he has a very interesting response to Christ's work in our life in verses 13 and 14. He says, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme, or to governors, or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good. You know, what does that have to do with being a Christian? And he tells you later, um, in 15, he answers that question. And he says, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free yet not using your liberty for a cloak. He's not telling you to submit to laws that violate his law, but he's telling you that if it doesn't clearly violate God's law, then you need to be obeying it. You need to be honest. You need to file your income taxes on time and filled out properly. You need to be careful how fast you drive. I run into problems like this. I was pulled over for going too fast a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so let's, I'm not talking just to you. I'm talking to me. Um, we, need, we need to, uh, if we work for a company, then we need to show up on time and do our work and leave on time. We need to, if we do work hourly, we need to report our hours accurately. If we're salaried, we need to make sure that our employer gets what he's due based on what he's paying us, gets a fair, way, fair day's work, or more than a fair day's work out of us. And he's saying that if we do this, if we live our lives this way in an honorable and, and, and way, then that will put to silence the words of foolish men. And what was going on back then was people were asserting that the Christians were trying to throw down, tear, down the, the, tear down Rome and destroy the society and they were going to do the whole, the whole place in just because of what they believed. And what Peter was instructing the Christians to do was to live in accordance with the laws of the land provided they didn't directly contract Dao's law and therefore destroy all these rumors that people were saying about them. And even though people aren't trying to kill us because of our faith today, we, we still have that responsibility to live in such a way as they cannot s spread false rumors about the truths of the gospel. The next one he tells us is, which is a couple of verses down in 17 and 18. See, in my Bible, I just marked them all in orange. <laughs> so that's why I'm just using it, because it was better than typing them onto a page. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, servants be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Here's the words again, honor all people. My grandfather used to say to me that you need to treat every man as if you can learn something from him. Every man, whether it's the person who's drunk in the gutter or the preacher who's standing up on Sunday morning. You have to honor and respect every person. Um, love the brotherhood. That talks about our love for one another, one of the things we discussed earlier. Fear God. Yeah, that's a good one. Which means reverence and awe and, awe and worship. It doesn't mean a human fear, screaming at the top of your lungs and running out with your hair on end. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about our honor and reverence for God and obedience to him. Honor the king, and servants be submissive to your masters, whether or not you think they, jo they deserve it. And that speaks to us, especially when we work for somebody who's difficult to work for. We still have to be submissive and, uh, and bring honor to him so that God is glorified. We don't know whether our life underneath an inappropriate boss will someday lead to that person's salvation. That's the point. All right. And then he, he does, he, then the next two are talking to marriages. And this is Mother's Day. He put wives first, then he gets to husbands. He says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. So, I, so he's saying that how you live with your husband can affect how they live with you. And then he says the same thing to husbands. 
in verses 3, 7, and 8, and 9, he has more to say to men than women, because we need it. Um, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Hmm, that's an interesting gift. Finally, all of you be a... So, so that's to husbands. So he's telling, he's telling us guys that if you're not living right with your wife, why should I listen to you? That's Gurney's quick summary. He says that your prayers be not hindered. So if you're married and you're having a hard time with your prayers, you ought to think about how are you living with your wife. Are you doing for her what God would have you do for her? Then he has a general instruction to both husbands and wives and non-married. In eight, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Now, he's saying, he's saying here, look, because of all these things that God has done for you that we talked about at the beginning, I don't want you returning evil for evil, and I don't want you speaking bad about those who speak bad about you. That's reviling for reviling. He's saying, instead, return blessing. So when somebody does evil to you, you return blessing. When somebody speaks bad of you, you return blessing. You don't act according to the world. And what does he say? He says, that you may in inherit a blessing. So he's telling us if we'll retire from our ways and withdraw from our ways and speak blessing for the evil, for e return blessing for evil, and speak blessing for reviling, then we ourselves will inherit a blessing. Boy, what a great way to get it. All right, let's see. Almost done here. Well, no, there's a whole book, but anyway. Um, and I am skipping over large chapters because I'm just trying to bring out a few points. The whole book is good. I'm not, but, but, yeah, the whole Bible, but we're just doing this. Now, what else, what else does he tell us? We skip on down to 3.15 and 16, a really great place. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conscience in Christ may be ashamed. Now look at he's tell, he's this is back on that same point about returning good for evil and good and good for somebody who speaks bad against you. He says you're doing this because you're the sanctifier, have holy or know that the Lord God is in your heart, and you're to be ready to give a defense. Because at some point when you're doing this. Somebody's going to say to you, why did you do this? And that's your chance to do what he says. That's what he's talking about. Give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So you don't give that defense out of pride. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm better than you. No, that's not the point. That doesn't get God's love over to them. You very simply and quietly respond because Christ has changed my life. Because of the Lord God Almighty. Because God asked me to return good for evil. He will give you the words. He will, no, he will speak to you. He will give you what you need to say when somebody asks you. That will drive home the word in them. And here it says, Having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evil doers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. But it, you're not to convict them. You return blessing and God will convict them. You answer clearly with scripture and God will ha cause them to see themselves in his light. And then at the beginning of chapter 4, he says, where are we? Oh, good. Um, Therefore, this is 4, 1 and 2. Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, 
Arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live in the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Um, so, I haven't really suffered in the flesh. I mean, I have been mistreated and spoken badly of and stuff like that. But I haven't certainly not suffered the way Christ suffered. But some of us may, and, and some of us may not, for our testimony, for, for Christianity. And he's saying, if that happens to you, don't worry about it. Um, this to me is not speaking about si sickness, because he's, the whole persecution going on at the time was because of faith. And, and if it was sickness, then, then only the Christians would get sick, everybody else would be well, but that's not the way it works. Um, so now we'll just, we'll just go on, we're just going to go on with a few more verses out of chapter 4. We'll start with verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now this is written nearly 2,000 years ago. And it's certainly, if, it was, if the end of all things was at hand then, it's certainly at hand now. We're a little closer than they were when this was written. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. He's saying that by our love walk, our loving one another, we can cover a multitude of sins. We can enable people to, to make the choices that will align them with the Word of God. Because none of us is perfect. Anytime you see something in somebody else, you've got to recognize there's also things in yourself. He says here in 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. He's saying be a good host without grumbling. Take those opportunities. As each one has received the gift, in verse 10, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If, if you know, another place he says, well, if you're a preacher, if you're a teacher, do these things as a service to God. Whatever gift you have, if it's teaching, if it's serving, if it's giving, if it's being loyal, if it's loving, what gift you have, you're to do it as if it, because it's, it's a way, um, because the gifts we have come from God and we show his grace by doing them in his name. Um, and, oh, well, okay, so here, here he says it explicitly in 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, that's great. So, he's, so he says that God has done all these things for us, and then he shows us, how we can respond to him as we walk through this life. You know, uh, ministering doesn't just mean on Sunday morning or being um, a pastor or a prophet. Ministering is how we treat one another, how we respond to those in life. You know, you're going down the street and the Lord, and there's a panhandler there who could be smelly and may not, and may not even be dressed well, and the Spirit says, give him some money. Are you going to do that? Hand him whatever it is God tells you to give him and say, the Lord bless you. I'm doing this because of Jesus. Or as Pastor Jack encourages people to carry some money around, always being able and ready to give. It's not like you need to give a lot. What you need to give is what God asks you to give at the point he asks you to give it to the person or organization that he wants you to give it to. You know, we support missionaries. Um, their pictures are on the map in the back based on where they go. When you support them, you're ministering to them. You're joining with them in the ministry that God has called you. Uh, you give to the church. We have Gino and Pastor Eugene who go to the prison. And our sort of, we support them from our evangelism fund. You give to our evangelism fund. Remember, we already took the money up. I'm just making some points here. You give to our evangelism fund and you're enabling, you're helping facilitate the work they do to lead men and Pastor Eugene's wife the work they do, and John goes with them too, the work they do to lead men and women who are incarcerated to the gospel. And boy, it's a tremendous work. There's a lot of people in that jail singing the praises of God. And when they get out, some of them are even here with us, then they continue on with the Lord. That's ministry. You drive down the road and see somebody with a flat tire and the Holy Spirit says, help them out. You pull over and you get out and you help them out. That's ministry. 
When you're doing, when you're stopping from your ways, you're on your way, you know where you're going, you're driving, and you have to, you have to uh, um, withdraw, yield, sorry, with whatever, retire, withdraw, and yield. You have to retire from what you had on your mind, withdraw from it, yield to the Holy Spirit, pull over, and help somebody. You're submitting to what the Lord is saying to you at that time. And that, that's ministry. So it's not a select few who minister in the, in, the, in the body. Everyone ministers in the body. We all minister and share the gospel with one another. We all listen to one another. We all support one another. We all love one another. And that is important. And he summarizes it in 17 here, he says, For the time has come, and this is written 2,000 years ago, for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? The point is that God looks at his church, and then he will move on. And he's asking us to align himself with his word. And... Um, and to move on with him. So this, this is, that's all the little, the points I wanted to yank out of 1 Peter today. Um, there, there's a lot more in 1 Peter. I mean, you could probably pe preach a month, a month of sermons on any single chapter or almost any single verse in this book. But these are the things that were jumping out at me over the last couple of weeks. So let me sort of draw back as we close here and summarize. The point is that in Ephesians it says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The that refers to the faith. the faith. The very faith that we used to get saved was a gift from God. His enabling us to believe and receive Christ. And, and here we heard in the beginning of this all these great things. You know, we're a royal priesthood, we're a holy people. He's, he's redeemed us with an incorruptible thing so that we'll always be redeemed. Um, and because of all these things he's done for us, he wants us to live in a way that brings honor and glory to him in this earth. He wants us to live publicly in a way that brings honor and glory to him, and he wants us to live privately in a way that brings honor and glory to him. Because he wants us to be consistent in all of our walk. Okay, And when we do this, when we do this, we inherit a blessing. Um, uh, in, uh, it says in uh, five six, which is in the fourth part, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When we humble ourselves, when we bend to him, when we learn from him and start doing things his way, he raises us up in due time. Okay? So I encourage you to read the entire, entire Bible and also, well, because I'm preaching out of 1 Peter, take a trip through 1 Peter and see what God says to you. Um, it's just a really fantastic book and it talks a lot about the challenges we face. So um, as we close, um, I look around, I think I know most of us, but what I want to ask, oh yeah, and I, all of us were praying for Greg Jr. and he's here with us today, so... You can, if you see him, if you talk to him, you want to you wanna say hi to him. He's at, back there in the back with his family. Um, but is there anybody here who's thinking about all this and, and not sure or not sure that God really loves them as much as this Bible says he does? Or, you're not, or even if you know that you haven't asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior or to come into your heart. Romans says that if we confess with our mouth as Jesus, that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, this is Romans 10, 9, and 10, then we will be saved. It's that simple. Doesn't, it's not based on anything we do. It's totally, as we quoted in, in Ephesians, based on God's work in us and for us that we apprehend. God does something. The question is, do we respond? What God did was he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who came as a man, lived as a man, died as a man, and was resurrected, that we could be saved, that he would be the propitiation or the payment for our sins. And the question is, will we accept that payment 
Or will we keep trying to do good things to pay him back? So if, you, if you've never accepted Jesus as payment for everything you've ever done or ever will do wrong, raise your hand and we, we'll pray together and you can accept that payment. Is there anybody who wants to do that? Okay. So I think I'm done. I don't really have a whole lot. But I, I thank you for listening to me again. And I, and I, I pray that all of us, let's, let's stand and pray together.